Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the historic Hill Auditorium for our panel discussion, The Fab Five at 25. My name is Andrew Martin, and I am Dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts here at the University of Michigan. I also stand here as a basketball fan and as an admirer at a distance of the group of men who were revolutionizing college basketball 25 years ago. I grew up in Lafayette, Indiana at a time when basketball was king. Think of the movie Hoosiers just 30 years later. These were the days of a statewide single elimination tournament to decide the state championship each season that captured my attention for a month each winter before March Madness would begin. I grew up watching Big Ten basketball back in the time when games were all on Thursday evening and Sunday afternoon. Remember those times? Uh, those were the days of legendary Big Ten coaches, including Judd Heathcote, Lou Henson, Gene Cady, Bobby Knight, and Bill Frieder. It was hard for me not to fall in love with basketball, especially college basketball, where I grew up. I left Indiana to attend the College of William & Mary in 1990. This was definitely not a choice dictated by my basketball fandom. Indeed, my alma mater still remains one of the five original Division I teams never to have made it to the big dance. During the fall of 1991, I was a sophomore, and my friends and I started hearing about what was happening in Ann Arbor. We had to go to a friend's apartment to watch television because we didn't have cable in the dorms, and we began to watch Jawan Howard, Ray Jackson, Jimmy King, Jalen Rose, Chris Webber, and their teammates every time they were on national television. At the time, we keenly appreciated what was happening on the court, but I was clueless about what was happening off the court with this extraordinary team. I had a chance to watch the Fab Five play twice, both during my breaks when Michigan played at Purdue. My most salient memory is Juwan getting the ball down on the block, making jump hook after jump hook against the Purdue defense. After leaving college, I went to graduate school, taught political science, statistics, and law for 16 years, and now find myself as dean at this great university, welcoming you all to this panel discussion about the Fab Five 25 years after having watched this team from the sidelines. As we know, the Fab Five stirred up a great deal of passion during their time on the court and in the years that followed. The purpose of our panel today is to have a public discussion of the legacy of the Fab Five. This event is sponsored by the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, where the mission of our faculty and students is to look critically at the world and to try to learn from it. From time to time, we also look at ourselves, and this is what we'll be doing here today. We're doing so because of the importance of this team to college athletics, to college basketball, and to the University of Michigan. We can learn a lot studying what happened in the past. As Winston Churchill once remarked, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. That's why we're here today, to explore where we've come from, to understand where we might be going. This is especially important in light of the events of the past two weeks when racist flyers and social media posts circulated around the University of Michigan campus. Race has always been an issue in this country and at Michigan, and it's important that we remember where we've been as we move forward. I'm interested to hear today about our panelists' experiences around race, and especially their advice for our students. Before we start our program, I would like to recognize that we have two of the University of Michigan regents with us here today, Regent Andrea Fisher-Newman and Regent Kathy White. Thank you so much for being here. I also would like to thank the people who made this event possible. Uh, Ann Hart and the entire LSA events team did a magnificent job putting on this event, as did the LSA marketing and communications teams and members of Michigan News, Michigan Creative, and the Department of Public Affairs. Before, we introduce, before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to acknowledge a few absences. Uh, Chris Weber was invited to attend this event, and he did not respond to our invitation. Uh, Jalen Rose had flight trouble, but his plane has landed at DTW, and he will be here as soon as possible, probably around halftime. Uh, Ward Manuel, uh, our athletic director, is at the Rutgers game today. Michigan Athletics is a co-sponsor of this event, and Ward asked us to convey his support for an open dialogue about the Fab Five 
experience. And now, it's time to get started. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our guests. First, Professor of Kinesiology at the University of Houston, Billy Hawkins. Next is journalist and visiting professor of journalism at the University of Maryland, Kevin Blackestone. <laughs> Former Fab Five member, now the president and founder of Ray Jackson's Rising Stars Academic Athletic Program, assistant high school basketball coach and small business owner, Ray Jackson. Thank you. Next is the first of the Fab Five to commit to Michigan. Today he is coordinator, business and community partnerships and head coach, boys varsity basketball, E-Course High School, Jimmy King. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Oh, man. And finally, my colleague who organized this event and will serve as our moderator today, Professor of Comparative Literature and Professor in the Residential College in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, Yago Kolas. <clears throat> Thank you, Dean Martin. And thanks to all of you guys uh, for taking time out of your very busy schedules to take part in the conversation. And to all of you who took time out on a beautiful Saturday to join us here today. So this is a little bit bigger than the classrooms I'm usually teaching in. Uh, but I know you didn't really come to hear me talk, so I'm going to try and keep this short. The impact of the Fab Five on basketball and on our cultural landscape was immeasurable. As we've just heard, it was felt even by a young Hoosier attending a small liberal arts college who would grow up to become a quantitative political scientist and our dean. He was not alone, of course. Their superb and electrifying play, their exuberant and authentic self-expression, and their courageous outspokenness transformed not only college basketball, but in some ways all of sport, and sparked challenging and increasingly urgent conversations about race, money, and education in big-time college sports. But you know all that. You know, too, that their legacy was left in limbo as a result of investigations uncovering the loans that one member of the team accepted. We're here, as Dean Martin explained, to address these topics openly in an academic setting, in keeping with the mission and the best traditions of the great community of students and scholars that comprise the University of Michigan. We have here an opportunity to lead by continuing and deepening the challenging and urgent conversations these players and their teammates helped amplify. How can universities like Michigan preserve their educational mission and safeguard the well-being of their students in the context of the rapidly expanding commercialization of college sport? What sort of opportunities do college sports provide us for addressing and overcoming social inequalities and cultural stereotypes? What is the legacy of the Fab Five of Michigan's own history? And what is the most appropriate way for the university to mark that legacy? But even as we take up these questions today, I know from my own experience that our event offers another deeper opportunity for everyone here. I met Jimmy King in March 2012 when he accepted my invitation to speak to two students in my undergraduate Cultures of Basketball class. He's come every time I've taught the course since then, and has even played in the intra-class three-on-three <coughs> tournament the students organize at the end of each semester. We actually won it in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> now, I pride myself on being an effective teacher, but I know my students feel that the hour and a half they spend with Jimmy is the unforgettable <laughs> highlight of the semester and that the challenging and inspiring lessons he imparts will stay with them forever. I understand why they feel that way. I feel that way too. It's because Jimmy is, among many other things, a superb teacher. 
In fact, though I don't know Ray as well, nor Jalen or Juwan at all, I believe that all four of these men are, and were when they were students here, superb teachers. In fact, I view them as one of the university's great resources, a trove of unique life experiences which they transform into accessible lessons. These are lessons not only about basketball or college sports, not even only about race or class or exploitation. They are deeper life lessons about joy, creativity, and integrity, about solidarity, trust, and loyalty, and perhaps above all, about freedom. We should, go ahead. <laughs> We should consider ourselves fortunate that we have here today something life doesn't often provide, a second chance. A second chance not only to hear their voices, but to listen to them, and so to learn what we may have missed when they first offered it 25 years ago. I, for one, plan to make the most of it. As the fellows used to say before stepping into the arena, let them hang. <laughs> so Dean Martin mentioned some absences, but there is one more. Juwan Howard couldn't attend, though he wanted to, because he is in training camp with the NBA's Miami Heat, for whom he's an assistant. <coughs> but Juwan took time out of his practice schedule to send a greeting, which we'd like to play for you now before I pose my first question to the panel. Thank you, and enjoy yourself. Hi, this is Juwan Howard. I want to say sorry I can't be there today. Unfortunately, because of the scheduling with the Miami Heat, uh, we have the season rolling around, so that's why I can't be present with you guys. But my heart is with all of you. First thing to come to mind is the brotherhood. Uh, that time there at the University of Michigan was some of the best years of my life. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to develop a relationship, not only with four other guys that were freshmen that came in the same year as me, but to uh, develop a relationship with a team that will always be remembered as one of the best collegiate teams in history. My favorite memory from the years being back in Michigan was when uh, we first stepped foot on campus. Uh, we moved into our dorms at South Quad, and there was uh, two baskets out there outside our dorm, uh, right out there on the playground. And uh, we started a, a five-on-five -five game. Uh, it was, wasn't scripted, but there was so many people that started to like gravitate and hear that we were outside playing. And uh, I, I never forget, all the dorm windows was open. Uh, a lot of students was outside watching and watching from their windows. And I think from there was where it all started and where it all began. And uh, I never forget that day. That was so special to me. It wasn't just the black socks and the long shorts. There was more to it, whether it was your game, uh, on the court, whether it was in practice, playing hard, uh, making your teammates better, uh, pushing one another, whether it was when one guy was down, uh, the guy picked his head up. Those memories, those special moments can never be replaced. And I think a lot of people don't know the behind the scenes of all the, the things that we've been through that's more special than anything, and that's what family is all about. I'm sure a lot of collegiate basketball fans saw the sacrifices that we made out there on the floor and how we put team first instead of I. The relationship that you know, the university and everything the university has done for us has been appreciated, and it goes hand in hand. And hopefully someday you know, the relationship continues to grow and build. Welcome, gentlemen. So I'm going to just start kind of falling off of Jawan's memory there of the game at South Quad and see if each of you would just take a minute and share a vivid personal impression from the moment, from the early 90s of the Fab Five. Maybe start with you, Jim. Well, Jawan was being very tame. He was like, I mean, we were out there flying, gunning, like, you know, just swinging off the rim. We were having fun. <laughs> right. So the things that kind of translated to the actual, um, you know, game here 
we were doing then. And, and that's when I think what Juwan is trying to say is that we realized that because that was the first time that we walked on the court together. Yeah. And I know most of you here, if you don't remember, the South Quad used to have two hoops outside. So where the bike racks are, mm -hmm. like if you're on Madison facing South Quad, those bike racks right there, that used to be basketball courts. So we came downstairs and played uh, pickup and uh, just started, you know, just, you know, playing with the ball, throwing it up and surprised that, you know, Ray standing there right there catching it, tossing it back. You know, we were just, you know, it was just natural. Right. So right. when we realized that, that's kind of when, you know, we were like, oh, okay. Cause this is, a, we were anxious to really just see how we would vibe off each other. And I think that's what was really special. How about for you, Ray? For me, it's kind of ironic that Juwan picked that because I think that was my thought as well, was the first time we touched the court at South Quad because that's when that light bulb went off, like, whoa. You know, we can actually all play and we play well together. You know, and from that point on, the chemistry was just, the relationship off the court just transpired, man. It was a great thing, but a lot of, what happened on that court was just heaven sent, man. That was God, man, that day. Cause I had just showed up. I think I was the last person getting to campus. Everybody was in Jimmy's room and we were like, man, let's go down and show him something. Right. <laughs> I was like, bet, you know, <laughs> let's, let's get and to it. another funny thing about that too is that if y'all, I don't know, cause I haven't been in there in a while, you took your chances on that elevator. Oh, most definitely, most definitely, most definitely. You took your chances, so most we ran definitely. down the stairs because we didn't want to get stuck in the elevator. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was a great time for us, man, because we had, I mean, the beautiful thing about the U of M now is we actually have a football team now. <laughs> you know? so, and see, back then, back then, our football team was the best thing going. And all the football players thought they could play basketball. So we had some of those out there that wanted to participate. And when we started jumping over their heads, I think <laughs> it kind of changed and built on that relationship too as well. So right. it was pretty cool. Perfect. So how about from a kind of spectators or journalist point of view, Kevin? What, sure. What um, uh, I think I saw, uh, I, was, I was a sports columnist at the time for uh, the Dallas Morning News. And uh, because the Fab Five, Fab Five was such a special entity, and because two Texans were on the team, including one in Jimmy, who I'd seen play in high school, uh, I think I saw all of their uh, NCAA tournament games. And from a media perspective, and in the context of what we're talking about here, I, my, my memory is of someone else's memory of something that happened. And it was a uh, press conference, um, pregame press conference uh, in between tournament games, and I can't recall what site. Um, but uh, the, all, all the guys came out, and uh, they get up on the podium, and they each take their seats. And the coach, Steve Fisher, came out and, and took his seat. And, and the recollection is, is that uh, Jalen Rose was sitting one of the far ends. And when he sat down, he had on a baseball cap. <laughs> and Steve Fisher took his seat. <clears throat> Take that cap and off. And he looked down and he said, <laughs> Jalen, you know how he talked, Jalen, like that. And Jalen wasn't paying any attention. <laughs> Finally said a little bit louder, Jalen. And he points to the cap. And Jalen kind of like rolls his eyes. Back <laughs> and takes off the hat. And it was just, it became, um, it became very telling, right, for these guys and for the media as to who was running this show. And it kind of flipped the script in terms of what the media expected yeah. of college athletics. And it would really go on to be, I think, um, a metaphor for how these guys would come to be known, not only here at the University of Michigan, um, but also in terms of a legacy in college sports, which I'm sure we'll get into yeah, we will. later. <clears throat> how about you, Billy? Do you have a memory? I, I do. I was, um, 
I was a doctoral student at the University of Iowa, the Hawkeyes, so don't hold that against me. <laughs> at, at the time, that, that 91, the fall of 91, 92, when they were coming in, and I was doing my research on the experiences of black student athletes at um, historically white or predominantly white institutions. And I remember when they um, was making their run for the um, final four, and, um, oh, and even up until then, and I was amazed at these young brothers that maintain this cultural identity, the style of play and all of that um, at this very conservative, athletic and academic institution. And so I was uh, you know, amazed at some of the brothers. You know, we definitely wasn't rooting for Michigan, <laughs> but we were rooting for them, you, you see. Um, so that was the, the, the sort of the spring of 92. Um, That's great, thank mm -hmm. you. So I want to kind of shift gears. This has been a difficult couple of weeks on campus at Michigan. Some of you may know from reading news headlines um, that just in the wake of the university introducing a new program for diversity, equity, and inclusion, a long-range uh, long plan, um, we awoke one morning to find the campus, uh, central campus, plastered with racist, white supremacist flyers. Um, very painful kind of experience for the whole community. So I'm just, I know, you know, from talking to you, Jimmy, and from the documentary that that's something you all experienced in a different form as well when you were here. And so, and, and you all may have some thoughts about this as well. You know, this is a time when I think we need to draw upon all the resources we can as a community. And I just wonder if you have any experiences or advice, anything you'd want to share with students here and the rest of us about how we might kind of move through this moment. Well, for me, I'm from Texas, so the racism is, is, is out there. I grew up in Austin, Texas, so for me, it's nothing new. And if you see, saw what we uh, went through and experienced from the documentary, yeah. we faced it then. I think the beauty of what we experienced was, and Juwan touched on it, was the brotherhood. We came together in that time. But being an intelligent man and coming from an intelligent family, you understand that that hate and negativity is a small few, you understand? The world is growing, man, and everybody's not caught up in color and racism right now. And my thing to everybody is don't get caught up in those that are hating. It's a lot of intelligent people that don't see race and color as a barrier, you understand? We just brought, banded together. I mean, we had a great team with Vasco, Palinka, you know, guys from all over, different nationalities, and they all bought into the system and we were brothers. Our blood was red. So for me, it's just, it's just a negativity attempt to separate what God is building, man, and, and the progress that this university is making and just people throughout our country. I think that we really start, or need to start looking at who we truly are and where we come from. And like right, right now, we're a community. If you go from here and shop and go get grab something, eat across the street, that is your community, even if you live in Livonia. So really we're all one community, whether you find yourself in Detroit whether you find yourself in E-Course, whether you find yourself in Austin, Texas, Iowa, California, New York, wherever. We're all one community. And until we really figure out how to operate in that sense, the nonsense that Ray is talking about when it comes to actually allowing a few bad apples to spoil the bunch, we're smarter than that. The time is now. The technology has made the world a much easier place to navigate. So there are no excuses when it comes to communication. And that's what this is about. That's the reason why we wanted to have this forum so that we can have this discussion because we have the power to change what's currently going on. But it, it, at the end of the day, it also comes to sacrificing. You know, those that know better have got to sacrifice and get out their comfort zone 
what they've been living, what you've been living and experiencing, it's time out for that. You have to stand and live for something. It's something I preach to all my young kids that I coach and deal with and mentor. You gotta live by something and live by a certain standard that you won't let anybody detach you from. Whether it's material, whatever it is, it's time for those individuals that really care to stand and separate. You understand? We can't keep hiding behind it and having, I mean, these forums are great, I love it. But it's time to take action in our daily lives. It has to change our everyday lifestyle. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, right? Because this is what embroiled the campus at uh, Columbia, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, cost leadership um, its job there because of a lack of response. Um, and I know that just reading the news stories that the response here has been significantly different. Maybe that's a lesson learned. Um, maybe it's the history of what has gone on here on this campus. Um, so, you know, it's, it's highly unfortunate. But the interesting thing is you guys come to represent kind of the... Uh, you kind of represent what uh, that kind of expression of, of hatred winds up being directed at on a college campus. And I think about Sean Harper at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania who's done a really interesting study which he just updated on um, uh, black male athletes on, on college campuses which points out that um, for most major universities where the uh, black male enrollment in the undergraduate level is less than 3%. Um, football and basketball teams, as we know, are 50 and 60%, which means that for most black males on most campuses, the reason they are there is to be part of the athletic class, which generates revenues for the university corporation, as opposed to the educatee class which is ostensibly why you come to a university anyway. So all of that vitriol is really directed at you. <clears throat> and one of the good things about sports is we often turn to sports as an answer, as a salve to make us feel better and to get over this kind of, this kind of struggle. So I don't know how the athletic class here is reacting to all this. I saw, I know that some of the football players um, the other yeah. week um, uh, protested with Fist Up uh, in, in um, homage to uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, and maybe this is something that they too um, may have to take up along with good meaning undergrads, grads here, mm -hmm. faculty, staff, yeah. and officials. I think from a social historical perspective, um, whenever there's times of recession, economic recession, <clears throat> um, racial tensions always um, flare um, and, uh, and, and individuals are exposed for their um, racism. And I think this is one of the, those times. And I think, you know, students, I, I grew up in the South as well and very segregated South. And I think it's important um, that for black students, and I train my children, and I have my youngest son, is um, we'll be indoctrinated. And, you know, you can never, you're always a, a political activist. You know, your presence makes you a political activist. Mm -hmm. And my, my daughter's the same way. Um, because of their presence, you know, even if they're verbalizing, um, you know, against racial injustices or not, you know, they step on a college campus that's historically white they're making a statement. And I think all students that are conscious and aware of justice should make sure that they themselves are also fighting on, on the right sides of justice. One of the ancient uh, texts um, that I often quote to students is, um, the creator of God is always on the side of those who fight for justice. And I always wanna be on that, that side of <laughs> the one that is doing <laughs> or, or is able to do um, the most. And I think students that have that conscious awareness should also be fighting um, for those um, inequalities to make things right. Yeah. Athletes and non-athletes right. as well. Thank you. 
Um, so this is, I think, kind of follows up, especially Kevin, since you brought up the issue of uh, the presence of athletes on campus and the generation of revenues. So I was thinking about how, in some ways, you all were kind of on the forefront of issues of revenue generation, uh, licensing, and so forth, right? And kind of put some of those questions on the table before all of those deals were very common. And this fall, everybody here knows, I'm sure, um, you know, Michigan's been unveiling the new Jumpman gear and uniforms uh, as part of a 170, what is it, $4 million contract with Nike. <laughs> So that's obviously created a public conversation about amateurism, um, commercialization in big time college sports. Some people feel, um, particularly given some of the issues of racial inequality that you flagged, uh, Kevin, that, um, that athletes should be paid or compensated in some form right, for their contributions there. Uh, but other people also feel that um, that that would be counter to their well-being, or at the very least, if they're not concerned with that, would be um, a violation of an amateur ideal and sort of spoil something unique about college athletics. So I, I really just kind of want to get a sense of how you think we might think about those matters and if there's a way to kind of get beyond just uh, pay them, don't pay them, or just what your thoughts are. So I'm, I'd like to start with you, Billy, because I know you've written a book, you have literally written the book on this matter. So mm -hmm. let's hear from you. I think it's amazing when you look at the sort of current arrangements when you have 90% um, of the revenue that's generated by the NCAA is coming from less than 1% of the student athletes. And of that 1% or less than 1%, over 60% are African Americans, um, males, that's generating that revenue. And my thing is if it was reverse, I don't think payment would be an issue. If whites were making, if white athletes were making the majority of this, I don't think we would even have that discussion about amateurism. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, because of the history of this country and how black men have always sort of bared the burden of sort of building institutions off of their blood, sweat, and tears, I think this is what we are sort of replicating again with collegiate athletics. And so, you know, I, I know the Supreme Court just this week turned down, you know, even looking at the case on amateurism. So uh, again, I think it's sort of showing how, um, you know, this idea of our place within this institution is sort of to generate revenue um, off of our athletic talent, off our physicality, right. unfortunately. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> You know, we've debated this for so many years, yeah. um, and the debate has, uh, has really moved forward. A, a quarterback at UCLA, I, his name escapes me, but a couple weeks ago, someone asked him this issue, uh, about this, this issue, and he, he responded, he said, well, just tell me if this is in fact an amateur sport that I'm playing and I'm an amateur, why, why aren't the coaches amateurs? Why aren't the referees amateurs? Why are people paying um, uh, thousands of dollars uh, for tickets to come watch me play in a, in a stadium that seats 100,000 people? Why are, tele why are television uh, uh, networks paying um, tens of millions of dollars to broadcast my games if it's an amateur sport? Uh, amateurism is a, is a complete and um, unadulterated sham. Um, <laughs> exactly. And it's become... Um, it's, you know, and, it, and as Billy points out, I mean, it's almost reached the point of, um, of becoming um, uh, immoral. Um, and just look at the history of these guys. Uh, their first year here, um, not only did they turn the basketball, in, basketball team from being a loser, wasn't it, they had a losing record before you got here, into a winning team. but. They also more than doubled the revenues and the from uh, two million dollars to about four point four million dollars. Um, the year that the Fab Five broke up, so that would be your uh, junior 90, year. Ninety three, ninety four. Ninety four, right? Uh, ninety four. Guess what the University of Michigan did? Uh, like a lot of other schools who who uh, saw the dollars on the wall, they cut a deal with Nike for about eight million dollars over a five or six year period, and then just last summer. Um, University of Michigan broke the bank 
when it signed a new contract with Nike for something like $170 million over 15 years, um, and how much of that is going to be remunerated um, in uh, health, well-being, um, finances to the people who are actually uh, bringing in the money based on their, um, their uh, blood and sweat. Um, it's a situation that needs to be um, rectified. Hopefully the courts will rectify this. There are enough lawyers out here that someone should figure out uh, yet another lawsuit um, for uh, organization efforts of, um, of, uh, of college athletes um, so that uh, the system can be made uh, more fair. We all enjoy the product, um, yeah. yes. but the way the sausage is made is um, abysmal. Well, for me, I've been touching on this subject for a long time, since 92. And for all my students, it was one of my first A's in a class. I wrote a paper on this, so. My oh, man. I wasn't, in, <laughs> I wasn't in class all the time, but when I was there. <laughs> no, nah, but to be honest, man, it, like he said, it's a sham, man. It, and I think our eyes were open early as a group, as a Fab Five, as a group. When you start showing up to Chrysler Arena and ESPN is there, CBS is there every time. And this is just for practice. It's not even a game day. You have Nike show up unveiling shoes for you before they even hit the market. And we're 17, 18 years old. Light bulb starts to click. We're going back to the dorm, putting our money together to get pizza, you know, just to do the little things that kids want to do at that age. So, the light bulb goes off and you start, start understanding your work. And as a group, man, we talked about it a few times in the in South Quad. We sat in the dorm and talked about actually transferring to a HBCU. You understand? To generate that for something that is gonna benefit our people at the time. Being young, not understanding, you know, that we all are one people. But we talked about it, man, and, and, and it's incredible now that they're still having that discussion 25, 20 years later, and these kids are generating. I mean, sports, as you can see, we had a chance filming the documentary going to ESPN Studios, and it's a bigger campus than U of M. So that tells you how much money sports is generating. And it's ridiculous right now that these kids don't get to reap the benefits of their hard work and sweat. Well, um, <laughs> I have, because I'm not totally sure on this, I might need some help. Is it, is it possible for someone in the business school to come up with a business plan and profit off of that and still keep a scholarship if they're on scholarship? No. If, if not, they still have the opportunity to take the money and then they can still stay in school yeah. and economically budget their own lifestyle. Greg Anthony did that, didn't mm -hmm. he? Yeah, you and so I'm just saying that there, are, there is a smart way to do this. We just got to figure out what it is. And again, going back to what you know we were talking about is, you know, come, we can't let we can't keep letting dumb people run the world like what's happening. Like yeah, we gotta sure. we gotta sure. do something. All right, we gotta yeah. stand. Because if 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 and I, I'm sorry, you know I'm going there. So you're good. Politically, what we see in to, today is really horrible and for the protocol that it takes what I tell my students that it's unfortunate that y'all don't get a chance to see what a real debate looks like like we have a clown running for president I'm not even joking so We, if that doesn't tell you something, 
that we got to start really coming together yes. to say enough is enough yes. and taking care of everybody because yeah. we have the power to. Like, there is no reason not to. And like I said, we're starting it here, as we always do. It always starts here. Y'all know that, right? So, uh, y'all know that? Okay. So, so you know, um, for me, you know, I just think, you know, we need to have more of a actionable plans or steps to make sure that people are benefiting from their work. You know, you know, there, if you don't mind, no, there, there is a, a model. Um, it may not be a, a perfect model. Um, I was at Georgia for 20 years, University of Georgia, and uh, music majors um, on scholarship. You know, they were able to go play a set on Friday, Saturday night. They had the little bowl, fish bowl out, collecting dollars, as well as selling CDs mm -hmm. that they sort of uh, mm -hmm. put together. Um, and I'm thinking they're on scholarship, generating revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, a football player that I used to counsel. He, he's in the league now, and he had a, a daughter uh, while he was playing at Georgia. And he started a business, put up a web page, and just when he hit the, the launch button to the, you know, start his business, he got a call from the athletic department saying, you're going to have to take your image and your name down because mm -hmm. you can't associate anything uh, we are talking about generating revenue with your name or image. And I'm thinking, who does this belong to? Yeah. You know, is it his image right. or his name? Right. You know, it's not necessarily athletic associated, right. but, you know, he's trying to support his family. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think there are some models out there that's available so, so the athletes can generate. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, <clears throat> you know, the NCAA is not opposed to remunerating uh, athletes more beyond... Um, room, tuition, and board. They just don't want to do it with their money. Right. So if you want to go see, does, does Michigan wrestle Ohio State here this year? Does anybody know? So arguably the highest paid college athlete in the country this year is Kyle Snyder. Kyle Snyder won a gold medal mm -hmm. um, in, I believe, his freestyle wrestling, which garnered him maybe a uh, $250,000, I think. He won another 50000 for winning the world championship and took in, I don't know, how much per month training probably for USA Wrestling. Um, and the NCAA is cool with that. Hmm. <laughs> so he's back at Ohio State continuing his studies and uh, wrestling um, uh, in NCAA tournament and probably win another um, title. You would think that maybe JT Barrett the quarterback of Ohio State who helps generate, I don't know, what do they make, 60, 70 million dollars a year in revenue just in football mm -hmm. alone, over 100, maybe? Over 100. Over 100 million just mm -hmm. in football alone would be compensated. But instead, it's going to be an athlete who is an expenditure athlete, I'm sure, at Ohio State, an athlete for whom his labor helps make that sport viable. Mm -hmm. So that's just how jacked up this whole system is. All right, I'm, that's great. I'm gonna, this is related. In a way, I'm gonna leave just implicit. Um, for a lot of people, maybe some people in this room, certainly around the country, the legacy of the Fab Five centers on the scandal, right? Um, at least for some people. And on the sanctions, uh, and the feeling that those sanctions set the program back. And so I know that there are some fans, maybe even some fans who were fans of you all when you were here, who feel angry or resentful or betrayed. Um, so I wonder, you know, if you, can un if you can understand those reactions, but even more importantly, if you had an opportunity to address them like you do here today, what you would say to those fans who feel that, you know, that sense of betrayal. What do you mean by, by betrayal? Do you mean by us or by the university? I'm sorry, no, that, uh, yeah, that's a good question, Ray. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say fans who feel betrayed by you all. Hmm. You can see if you can speak to them. Because I know you can speak to the fans who feel betrayed by the university and we're gonna get to that. 
That's go easy. ahead and tackle that one. Yeah, that's that's an easy one. That's a layup. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's a layup. I mean, those that feel like we betrayed them, I would like to make them feel worse. You know. <laughs> <laughs> In our honesty, because we, right. we didn't get what we didn't get what, what was coming to us. In our honesty, I wish we all could have got paid because me, I didn't receive anything. But my association with teammates has placed me in that same predicament and same boat. And we have 15 other guys, 12 other guys that didn't get anything. You understand? So for me, and going back to the money situation, I would like to make them matter. I would like to make it worse. You know, everybody got 100,000. Now how you like that? You know what I'm saying? Everybody got something out of it. Because the game now, it's all monetary. Even at the high school level, you got kids going to college, man, and they don't want to talk about it. And I hate to be the bearer of great news, <laughs> but these kids are making $100,000, $200,000 before they even get on a college campus. You understand what I'm saying? So for me, I could care less how they feel. Okay. You understand? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because I know we played the game the right way. We put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. And the results were excellent. So at the end of the day, man, <laughs> I could care less, brother. <laughs> I could care less. <laughs> You want to add anything? Nothing to add. I echo the sentiment. And okay. I, I just, you know, again, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, we have to, I mean, it's, it's, we recognize certain things in, in, in one area, but I think that we don't empathize enough with others and, and because it gets skewed by the amount of money. If there was a 12-year-old child working for their parents and their parents wasn't paying them, but they were working as if they were an employee, we would be upset with that. It's kind of the same. It's not the same thing, it's in it's the same similar. vein. It's similar. So I think the amount kind of skews it a little bit but um, yeah, the guys really, you know, really need to be taken care of because it's ridiculous to literally have these, us walking right here on campus and in the mirror there is, in the mirror there is um, your jersey with your name on the back and we're literally putting our money together in a pile like, like what are we eating tonight? And that's when, and we're going to Taco Bell, and y'all familiar with the campus, that new beautiful building that's erected right here that has the nice eatery and the nice uh, uh, rooms or, or uh, condos in there. Well, yeah, right next to that, used to be a Taco Bell, you could tell because it looks like the old Taco Bell with the arched windows. <laughs> That's where we used to walk in. <laughs> and they used to look at us like, what are y'all doing? We just put, put the money on the counter. And we like, it's all we got. So, so, wow. and, and, and they would give us tacos just because they knew who we were. But. That's NCAA violation. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's what I, right. It is a violation. And that is a violation. <laughs> so can I follow up with you? Yeah. Jimmy? Yes. Because we've had this conversation before uh -huh. with my students in class. And um, I know that one of the responses that sometimes comes up is, but you all knew what you were getting into. So I think some of the feeling of betrayal that some people feel is a sense that, and it doesn't pertain to the two of you, obviously, um, but to others, or to one other, that um, that you knew, you knew what you were getting into, so. You don't know everything. No, you don't know everything. Right. You don't know everything, and especially when what you're being you know? recruited. Yeah. They're telling you one thing, and it's something else. And for instance, when Fisher came into my house, 
he told my parents, it's all about academics, yes. getting your degree, blah, blah, blah. First day of practice, pulled us in a circle. He was like, now I know what I told your parents. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all are here to do one thing, yeah. and that's to play basketball. And that's the truth. When you look down the schedule and see Duke, <laughs> Michigan State, Indiana, you know you're not here to go to communications class, a kinesiology <laughs> class. You know, who cares about that? You know? But, but, but like I like to tell, tell everybody, <laughs> you don't know what you're getting into. And it's on us now as former college athletes to educate those coming through the system now. Like, we were green. We didn't know anything. If, if we would've knew what we knew now, we probably would've walked away from basketball at that time. We would've boycotted. Yeah. You understand? We wouldn't have played any games on TV. We wouldn't have showed up. As you saw in the documentary, we wore bl blank navy blue shirts. We started wearing black socks. That was a protest. All of that was done with a conscious effort. You know, so it's on us to educate these kids coming through the system now. Brand yourself, build your brand. It's okay if you can make 100,000, I use that number, but 100,000 and give them their scholarship back and go to the school you wanna go to. See me, if I look back on the, on the system now, I'm a Michigan fan without even coming to Michigan. I love the wing helmets, I'm a football fanatic. So I, I was one of the only guys in Texas that really talked about Michigan football in the University of Michigan. But if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I would have never stepped foot on campus here. Because there were other schools that were offering the bag, like we like to call it now. You understand? But I chose the school that I liked. I didn't choose the school that liked me the most. Right. And that's a big decision to make when you're picking a college, especially as an athlete. You know, it's a difference between going to a school that you like as opposed to a school that likes you. They will invest in you and make sure that you live to the potential of the dollar that they put in your pocket. So it's an education that needs to take place with these young guys, but it takes, it starts with us coming back and give them, giving them that knowledge and wisdom. You know that we sign contracts every year. So we, it's basically a non-negotiable contract, but it's a contract. Exactly. So when they tell you, when they sit in front of your parents and they say, we're going to give him a four-year scholarship and a possible fifth year if he needs it, but really you're signing a one-year one scholarship year. that you have to re-sign every year? That started with us. Yeah. So they're, you know, they're, it's, oh. we have to really understand <laughs> how... What's happening? Hello, boy. Yeah. How are you? How are you doing? Welcome. Thank you. What's up, fam? What's up, baby? What's up, baby? What's up, man? What's up, baby? What's up, Kev? How you doing? Hello. Great, Good bro. to see you. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. How you doing, man? Thank you guys Good for doing this. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, then. Please continue. Sounded <laughs> good. <laughs> Sounded good. Sound good. I'm going to use that interruption because you're just in time for the next question. Okay. Um, who is that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is Jalen Rose. How you guys doing? <laughs> you gotta start. You gotta start. You gotta start. You start. You start already. Uh, next question. Okay. Um, so one of the ways everybody here knows that um, professional sports franchises and colleges and universities commemorate the great teams and individuals of their past. Uh, is by hanging banners in the rafters of their arenas. Um, the University of Michigan maintains that it'd be inappropriate to display the banners that symbolize the, the wins in the 1992 and 93 Final Four, since those wins were vacated as part of Michigan's self-imposed sanctions. That's where we're at right now. So the question for everybody here, um, we can start with you, Jalen unless you want to kind of get warmed up. Okay, we'll start right. with you. How do you think the university can best mark your place in the institution's history? First, thanks everybody for being here today. We appreciate this opportunity. It means a lot 25 years later. This is probably for me, my 
third or fourth time being here since we left school 25 years ago. And I wasn't going to miss it today. I was not going to miss this today. Um, you just pay attention to trends around the country. What does Penn State do for Joe Paterno? What does Ohio State do for Jim Trestle? What does UMass and Memphis do for Coach oh, okay. Calipari? There are ways when there are situations that happen on campus with the athletes that when those sanctions end, they still find a way to embrace their past. For us, I'm going to just give you guys a timeline. We left school in 1990. I left in 94. You guys left in 95. We weren't honored over those next handful of years before the sanctions actually happened. So just think about this. From 95 to 2000, we weren't honored at all before the Chris Webber sanctions happened. So what I think they could probably do is uh, they're not returning the money. I bet that, right? <laughs> they're, not return, they're not returning the money. I don't think that's happening. Um, I think you could commemorate the Fab Five by just creating um, a Fab Five banner, right? That's one way to do it. Thanks. I'm going to let others get in, but y'all go ahead. I kind of, you know, agree. I mean, I think the, the, if it's not possible um, after doing the research to rehang the banners, then maybe an alternative. Uh, who knows what that looks like. But I do think that it's been precedented before, so I don't see a problem as to why it would be an issue doing the same thing here. I don't really think it's an alternative, man. I mean, this, this, this university hadn't, spent, hadn't spun backwards since the Fab Five touched the campus. It's no alternative. It's no other plan. Put the banners back up. You know, that is simple. It's simple. It's simple. Y'all may have a stake. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is the first time I've been in um, Ann Arbor, which is uh, enemy territory for me. That's why I'm wearing my <laughs> Northwestern purple. <laughs> Just to let y'all know. Um, uh, I believe in putting the banners up. I don't believe that the banner should have been taken down. Um, unprompted last night when I got to the Graduate Hotel, great hotel, and I hustled downstairs to, uh, to watch a baseball game in the um, watering hole there, and two people sitting there, I, I don't know them, they don't know me, although one guy recognized me, and, and I said something about the banner, and both people said the banner should be back up. Um, you know, I, I don't even, and Jalen brings up some great comparisons, yeah. but, you know, one of those comparisons is, a, is, a, is disgusting, a criminal yeah. <laughs> you, you situation as, as you can have, and some of the other ones are kind of unsavory. Um, you use the word betrayal. The system is what betrayed people. Mm -hmm. It's not these guys. You know, um, I, I remember when the whole Cam Newton thing went down at Auburn and the rumors came out and stories about his father taking, shopping his son for, I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars here or there. I'm like, what is wrong with that father? You realize how valuable Cam Newton is? <laughs> right. You're <laughs> underselling your son right. to these universities. <laughs> so I, I have absolutely no problem with this. This is, it is um, completely disingenuous to me. And as Jalen said, you know, uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't return the check, then return the banners. Okay. Yeah. I echo the same sentiment as most of the panelists that they should be, you know, restored because, um, and, and, you know, when you talk, go back to the question about fans feeling this sense of betrayal, the fans should feel a sense of betrayal from the system. 
and not the attention placed on the Fab Five because again, it is the, the system that is restricting um, athletes' ability to generate you know, revenue from their own likeness and image. So I think when you, know, when you look at um, what these guys has sort of contributed to this institution and to college sports in general, you know, I think policy should be invoked from this. You know, um, that sort of change or lessen this sort of commercial restriction that's placed on student athletes now. Right. But when you look at it, man, and, and I'm the norm when it comes to college athletes. I didn't go pro, so I don't have a professional jersey or banners from the NBA yeah. to show my kids. I'm the norm, mm. and the majority of our teammates did not play professional sports. Mm. This is our profession. This is our. This is the top, this is where we peaked. So for me, it's a generational thing. I wanna be able to bring my kids back to the school and be like, hmm, look at that, you can't, you can't handle daddy. Daddy was a cold piece, you know what I'm saying? That, that's what I wanna do. And, and not just for the Fab Five, I see some of the guys that ball with us and made us better men that, ha that were a big part of that, those two, three, four years that need to be accepted as well you know it wasn't a fat five thing that's the beauty in what we're here talking about the fat five but we always did five times because it represented the entire team it was the five of us what the media liked the hype but it represented the entire team and the family not just the team the coaches we had a great family so i want to see them recognized as well because that's what we got to hold on to So I want to give each of you a chance, if you want to take it, to ask someone else on the panel a question, something you may have wanted to ask them that you haven't gotten a chance to ask, something you'd like to know. <laughs> you want to look at it. <laughs> you don't have any questions. Oh my God, you opened up a can of worms, y'all go. That's why we're here. Okay. All right. And shout out to Mr. and Mrs. Freddie Hunter. One of our, <laughs> can you please stand up, please? This is what, and this is what it's really about, right? This is what it, exactly. Without, without guys like Freddie, there is no Fab Five. No Fab Five. Freddie is the type of person or type of player that we kind of emulated because coming in, we didn't know what this thing was really about. You know, we, have, we needed someone to, you know, kind of learn from. And thank God we had upperclassmen who were very responsible. So we had a little bit of that, but we also, you know, needed to learn the ropes. We had each other to lean on, but thank God that we had somebody with, you know, the integrity yes. that a Freddie Hunter has. Yes. So thank you, Freddie, for coming out tonight. Yes. Also, Right next to them is Miss Dottie Day. Dottie, please stand up. <laughs> now, Dottie is like Mama. The, the surrogate mother. She's <laughs> been around the program, and I dare you to try to top her any trivia or, <laughs> or top her as far as travel miles because you can't. She was there before every team bus, every hotel meeting, she was there. That's our surrogate mother that, you know, was our mother away from home. So thank you, Dottie Day, for coming tonight. And right next to her is Miss Shelly Kovacs. Please stand up, <laughs> Shelly. Come on, Shelly. Now, if we did that when we walked there, she'd be like, stand up, pull your hat straight. <laughs> no, 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 she really wasn't that. She wasn't that bad. But, but really, Shelly was an academic advisor here, spent 30 plus years, just recently retired. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Put your business out there like that, I'm sorry. But um, again, this is, this is the framework that we walked into that allowed us to be successful. Yes. And my kids, Ecor, stand up. Ecor, stand up. <laughs> These young gentlemen right here, 
I want them to see what is ahead of them. This is important, this is history. And what I tell them is that we're no different than they are. We just had dreams that materialized because we worked hard at it and that we had support. So for you guys, just know that the sky's the limit and this is just the beginning. So thank you all. Thank you all for your support. I love you guys. I'm sorry, I had to take that's like a public service announcement, but <laughs> back good. to the show. That's good. You know what? Good. That's good. Thank you. I think actually what I'd like to do, if it's good, you all are good with this, is open this up and start taking some questions from the audience. Can I ask my question for oh, you? you did. I didn't think, you know, I feel like Jimmy was covering for you all. You didn't want to do the question. No, it's so one question. It's one question I never asked, but, but we know pretty much everything about each other. So okay. we ask those questions. Oh, As you can tell, we like to communicate. One thing, because I call every, my son, I call him Jalen Rose sometimes. <laughs> and he does this all the time, and I don't understand this. And everybody asks me, why you call me Jalen Rose? Why? Did you wear your practice jersey backwards all the time? <laughs> <laughs> so while we were in school, there were um, a series of silent protests that we engaged in. Um, I don't know if it's got mentioned before I came. Yeah. The Black Sox was yes. actually one. Yeah, we talked about it. Um, the plain blue shirts were actually one. And uh, me wearing a different number in practice was my personal one. Um, Chip Armour, he wore 43, and his uniform was bigger, and I wanted a bigger jersey, and I begged him, could I wear his? And he said yes. And so not only was I gonna wear his jersey, but I was gonna wear it backwards because uh, it was, it was my personal way to appreciate our position, but yet I was kind of plotting our promotion. Mm, and good. I knew that we were, we had an opportunity to accomplish a lot. And this is a, this is a mega stage. And Michigan is a football school. 115,000 every Saturday. We're gonna crush Rutgers today. We're gonna beat them. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna, right? We're gonna beat them by 55. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. yeah, but, sure. but, but, when, but when you come, when you come to a football school, there's a different level of expectation as a basketball player. In maybe a hundred plus years, I think the school has gone to the final four maybe six or seven times ever. In football, that's expected every year to be a top five team, to be a top ten team. So for me, the jersey and the same with the other silent protests, it was just our way to rebel against the system, but try to do the best we can to take advantage of the opportunities we were given. So, so yeah, let me go. Right. Go, ahead. Okay. go ahead. So let me ask one, you know, you can say yes or no, or you can just, you know, um, don't answer it. Those of you that have kids, would you advise your kids, knowing what you know about collegiate athletics and they got an opportunity to come to the University of Michigan and to play, would you advise them to come uh, to go elsewhere? I know, Ray, you say you, you would have went to somewhere else, but. No, I like we talked about it during the camp we had this summer. Right. I would have never got to know them if it was like it is now. I'd have spent one year overseas and then got in the draft. I'd have went to when it got the money and took care of my family. I wouldn't even went to college, to be honest. So no, <laughs> my son is the caliber of us. He might not step foot on a college campus. Hmm. Yes, for the opportunity, if it arises, for instance, my kids aren't here tonight because they are in a program called Michigan Pathways that allow them to have full scholarships yes. here. So there's a program that was allowed and allotted to the residents in my community that for the sophomores and uh, seventh graders at the time, they're now juniors in uh, eighth grade, but it's still a great university. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and what we're here for is just to make it a better one. You know, there's no such thing as perfection. Anything that's perfected dies. That's, that's, that's a myth. There's no such thing as a perfect thing. But 
times change, you know, culture, culturally we grow or we should. And that's the point we're at right now. That's why we need to take advantage of this. And that's why my kids, even though, uh, you know, like say for instance, if they didn't have that opportunity and I had to pay for it, that's a bitter pill because of the way that the treatment has been for all athletes, not just at the University of Michigan, but all athletes to do what we've always wanted to do and to be meaningful, not just on the court, but off the court. Our idols are Muhammad Ali, you know, Jim Brown, you know, guys who were active and who were great players, but saw the bigger picture and used this stage to change. And that's what this is about. So we're, we're so happy to see that we're, that you guys are here for us and we want to, that's what this is about. We want to include y'all into this so that we can really change this culture because we have the power. I keep saying that, I'm gonna keep repeating it, but I really believe that this is the catalyst for that. Did you have a question, uh, Kevin? Yeah, I got a question, you wanna answer? Sure, I w the answer to the question, I would say yes, um, but two words kind of popped in my mind sitting here. Um, and I think it kind of defines the relationship between our Michigan basketball teams with the Fab Five and the university. The two words, one are pain. For the university, while the Fab Five era was an eruption, it created an excitement and enthusiasm that uh, probably will never be captured again. The 1989 team, I idolized them. Glenn Rice, Terry Mills, Lloyd Vaught, Sean Higgins, Romeo Robinson. They won the championship, but they're not a more notable group than us. We didn't make that up. We didn't create that. And when you think of it that way, the pain that occurs is you have a group of individuals that participated in sports at the university and then you leave and it's like, we glad they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just turn the page and forget that they ever happened. Mm -hmm. That's really what has taken place. Thus leading to the banners being taken down. Now remember, for those that don't know, that was a school decision. Yes. Not an NCAA decision. Mm -hmm. Which means if Monday the school wanted to put the banners up, they actually could. I don't know if people realize that or not. <laughs> So, so there's going to be some pain, there's going to be some friction when you're clearly being denied. And I don't know if his name has come up today, Steve Fisher, okay? His name is nowhere on this campus right now. Three Final Fours, won a national championship. Since he's been at San Diego State, and I love Michigan, Bleed, Maize, and Blue, I would bet that they've been in the top 20 more than Michigan have in basketball All down. All since down. he left. Yeah. Okay, he's a terrific coach, a terrific man, has an amazing family, okay? As much as I feel like we didn't deserve a lot of negative things that have taken place because of those sanctions, I double down on that, that he definitely didn't deserve it. Um, that's one. Um, the perception for me is Five African-American kids playing at the University of Michigan in the early 90s, jersey on backwards, hat on backwards, listening to NWA and Ice Cube and EPMD in the locker room. That was a cultural firestorm that happened on our campus that the world loved, but it wasn't really loved on our campus. By our students, of course, they were with us. They were doing exactly what we were doing. We were partying with the students. We were, we were doing everything everybody else was doing, except we had to go to practice the next day. <laughs> and so that family, that, that bond 
And that trust was cultivated through the students. And because of this support is why the Fab Five is right now still relevant. at 25, the number one trending topic in the country. Yeah, I looked at it, I got off the plane. I'm like, Whoa. like this is the number one <laughs> trending topic? I didn't know Not that. even Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I'm serious, and he running for president, <laughs> right? So like, this is a big deal. Wow. And that perception of seeing me for, I, I'll use myself for an example. I never would have thought I'd be the founder of a charter high school. Never. That was not a goal of mine. That was, that, that was just something that just happened. And to be here 25 years later and to actually have one of the students from my high school here. Chanel, are you there here? There she is. Hey, Chanel, how are you? Oh, hey. <laughs> so there was a period of time where the Fab Five was not being acknowledged by the university, but I'm also a donor. I have a scholarship endowment that's graduated three kids from here. Indeed. So I wasn't being, <laughs> it, 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 it was really weird because I was not being acknowledged as an athlete, but I was being acknowledged as a donor. I know. <laughs> so it, it, cre it created a weird spin in my mind and that, that would, again, leads to perception because, yes, we were the Fab Five, we were brash, we talked trash, we wore baggy shoes, we wore black socks, we wore all of that, but we paid attention to the game of life. And that was really important to us. Did we want to win the championship? Of course. Duke was better than us our freshman year. They were, they beat man, us. Man, y'all quit saying they, that. They were, I, they were, that. they were. <laughs> like, you gotta quit saying they, that. They, they, they were, they were, they were. All I know is we idolized Vegas and they beat them the year before. Now, yeah. Carolina, we should have beat them. <laughs> not, 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 that, that, that's just being real. But, but the reason why I bring that up is the Carolina team ain't getting honored on their campus. Only time they're going to get honored is on a basketball court. This ain't a basketball court. Right. Like, this, this is really lifestyle, social. Um, spiritual, and for this moment to be taking place, I think this should be the lead catalyst to truly repair the relationship to where it's not awkward. Because it is kind of awkward <laughs> when, <laughs> like, like, like me and Jimmy were just here Friday, and uh, we were excited about Brand Jordan being a new sponsor or whatnot, and uh, there was a Fab Five moment to where we were gonna be, I guess, uh, acknowledged, you know. But the reality of it was, when that night ended, that ended. There's nothing up anymore. It was good when we were standing there. Stand there, take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> we back yeah. with Nike. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm talking to the Nike dude, like, can y'all sponsor my school? Right, right. Like, like, wait a minute, I'm walking through the mall, I'm seeing Hirachis being re-released, like, I can't even get y'all to send 50 pairs of shoes to my school for my students. So when that happens in real life situations are also a part of this melting pot, I think that pain, hopefully this becomes a catalyst to break down that barrier. Yeah, yeah. that's Thank right. You. Thank you, Jim. So with that, what I'd like to do um, is kind of open the conversation to the community. Um, Great. So here's how this works. Uh, we've got mics here. Um, so you can just step to the mic if you have we've a question. An audience. You can also, wow. you can also tweet your questions um, using that trending hashtag, uh, Fab5 at 25. Reception may be spotty. This is an old building. Um, so if you really have something you want to say, make sure you get it out, step to the mic. Um, try to be respectful. The Fab Five bring out strong feelings. Um, and also try to keep your questions somewhat short so everybody has a chance. Go. My question to you is, 
What is your perception of what a university is here for? What is your perception, perception of what the university is, is here, here for? for? Hmm. Is that to someone in particular or anybody? Well, the basketball players. <laughs> <laughs> the basketball players. <laughs> well, Go ahead. I'll, let me start. Um, this is a educational institution, whether it's an education in finance, whether it's an education in religion, whether it's an education in life. life. This is a university, and going back to what I said earlier about really learning and understanding where we come from. It's called a university because it's the study of everything under the universe. This is a collective education and there shouldn't be any kind of barriers that allow a student to grow within their talents and benefit from it. So for me, uh, the school is here to allow a budding young person to a full-fledging adult that's responsible for the growth of the community. That is what I think the university is or should be used for in a transition from a young person to an adult. That's perfect. That's, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and I'll take a second spin to that. It's tricky when you're a student athlete because you're here because your academic prowess allowed you to get admitted in Michigan, first and foremost. It doesn't matter how well you can play. If you can't get admitted in Michigan, you can't come here. That's one of the biggest misconceptions about the Fab Five. Right. There was a group that came after us, and I remember talking to Maurice Taylor, the late great tractor trailer. They was like, was they on y'all about going to class like this? <laughs> like, y'all yes. gonna be going to school. <laughs> it's, a, it's an Ivy League school of the Midwest. Like, y'all yes. going to school. Mm -hmm. That's gonna happen. But the dichotomy is that when you're an athlete and as a founder of a school, as a college graduate, I hate to say this, but it's true. I'm going to be judged more on my athletic prowess than my academic prowess. If I can't, I can't go to Coach Fisher and say, hey, we got a big test tomorrow, Coach. You know, I love to go home and study and I practice today. He could take my scholarship. So for the university, the job is to educate and enrich and allow young people to grow under this infrastructure, but definitely the goal, hopefully, is to, to graduate. Right. I, I used to be a basketball player 30, uh, many pounds ago. <laughs> so, and, and I've been at a college campus for over 30 years, and I would initially say it's, it's about educating students, but it's about capital accumulation, um, point blank. And, and education is a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just get another question. All right, hi. Um, thanks all of you for coming. Uh, just three quick questions. Um, three? three? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One, okay, okay. I guess this is like, um, I'm just messing with look you. Look at the line okay. behind you, man. Okay. <laughs> One question. Um, One of you talked to uh, Robert, or not uh, Robert, um, Lewis Bullock and Maurice Taylor about getting them involved. Like, cause I know like the banners like going up, people we focus on the 92 NCAA finals, 93 NCAA finals, but the 97 postseason NIT and the 98 Big Ten tournament. Cause I think they should be stepping up more too. I mean, it's good what you're doing. I love what you're doing in this, that, but they need to step up to the plate more too. And I, I'm just wondering, have you like tried to get them more involved in your um, fight, if you will? And then two, um, there's been talk about no, how- No, 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 what? I guess that's it then, just about the stipends. Um, I think that in doing or having the conversation mm -hmm. to possibly put the banners back up or an acknowledgement of that team helps the 97-98 team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I don't see Matthew. We've got... I'm right here. Where? Oh, there you are. Do we have anything? <laughs> Uh, Jennifer Crail uh, from Twitter says, can an MBA student, MBA, Masters of Business, on a scholarship profit off of their ideas and ventures while in school? Does She's everybody understand the question? Can an MBA student, MBA, not MBA. It's all masters. Can an MBA student profit off of their ventures while in school? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 
just like the musicians that I mentioned. Right. You know, they, they profit. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, let's take one over here. So, my name is Lucian. I'm, uh, I'm from Bronx, New York, and I'm a freshman here on campus. And ever since I've been here for the month, I felt pretty disconnected from the community because I come from a much more diverse place. People embrace each other differently, talk differently, listen to different music. I'd like to know how you guys fit in the community that didn't have that much diversity because, let's face it, I mean, I'm from the Bronx, New York City, much more diversity than Ann Arbor. I'd just like your opinion on that. Thank you. There's actually an undercurrent taking place current on campus right now we with about that same that topic. Bit. You guys addressed it before I came? A little bit, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead um, Chanel, you wanna talk to this? You talk to me about this. Can you, you mind allowing her to speak on this topic, please? <laughs> oh, I follow what's happening now. <laughs> please allow her the opportunity to speak on this. Because as a, as a founder of a charter high school, I have 400 kids in the building. We have a nine through 16 model. So in a couple of more years, we're gonna have 800 students. It's gonna be our job to make sure they graduate from high school, but also graduate from college. So these are things through our college success that we talk about a lot. Good. And so it's important for somebody on campus to talk to us. Hey, I'm Chanel. So I'm black, obviously. Um, and I come from a place where everyone around me is black where majority of my school is black, where my majority of my teachers are black. So I come from a place where I always feel at home. I always feel like I have somebody to talk to about what I'm going through. I always have somebody um, by my side who I feel like will be there for me and can genuinely understand um, what I see, the things I hear, the the conversations that transpire in the dining hall with my white counterparts, with counterparts, with my peers who, are, who don't look like me, who don't come from the same background as me. Um, the school right now has about a 4% uh, population of black students. And because of that, there are a lot of things that transpire on campus where people don't exactly understand how we feel. They don't understand what it means to be one or two of the only students in the classroom who are diverse. They don't understand what it means to have to wake up every morning and look in the mirror and be reminded that I am black. But see, the powerful thing about being part of the minority on campus is that when we come together, we make waves move. We have forums and community discussions such as this to be able to talk to each other, to be able to listen to one another. And I feel like if you search for those resources that are here, I feel like you'll have a much better experience here on campus. And there's nothing wrong with uh, being, don't ever feel like there's nothing wrong with um, being in a group of people who are, who come from the same background as you. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to um, have that safe place um, where you don't feel marginalized. So I think that for you going forward, and especially as a freshman who's new to the campus, find, branch out, find those communities that are in place so that we can feel accepted, so that we can feel like we can go to class and not be looked at in a certain way. Does that make sense? Okay. Hello, my name is Albert Huddleston from Flint, Michigan, class of 2000 in Flint, Michigan. I want to thank Jimmy Keene and his entourage for coming to Flint, Michigan to distribute water and stuff. We still need our support. We still need our love. Please don't forget us. Please don't forget us. Um, real quick questions. Um, ES Sports had a lawsuit against Ed O'Bannon. Did you guys ever get into that one? Did y'all get compensated? And how was Leon Derrick's as a player from end up? Oh. <laughs> it was good, great to see you. Big up to Flint, Flint in the house, Flint, Tone, Flint Stones, 
that's a, that's that's Detroit too. That's all it is. You know, it's the corridor. Yeah, it's a corridor, right? The little brother with love. But um, you know, um, what was the question? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> because I was going to go Flint. I was going to go straight on, Flint. Yeah. What was the question? Ed O'Bannon. Yes. 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 Did y'all get compensated as well? Did y'all participate in that lawsuit? Um, it was a class images. action. It was a class action lawsuit that you can choose to participate in. They send you a letter that they send thousands of athletes. You fill it out, sign it. Um, you know, date it, and it's it's you know there's no. You can opt out if you want to, or if you wanted to uh, sue EA on your own. But if you participated. Uh, in the class action suit, which I did, I did get a check. It was very nominal, <laughs> but I did get a check. And um, yeah, so, the, you know, it, big up to Ed for trying to do something uh, to skew the conversation and the actions to the right direction. But there needs to be more. And just like I said, not just you, I mean, every, all U of M alumni, you know, I'm from U of M Flint, you know, we need your help as far as the water thing. It's not a joke. We here, yeah, make sure, make sure that um, you come see me so we can uh, hook up. I got you. Thank you. Matt, Matthew. How can the student body most effectively continue this conversation, asks Sunny Bhagavadula. How can the student body most effectively continue this conversation? So, I don't want to go renegade here. <laughs> we live in a climate now, you see it happening in the NFL, for example, that has yes. trickled to other sports. You know, the word protest is, is a tricky word because they're what's considered passive protests, like strikes or picketing. Then there's a direct protest where it actually leads to not participating because what I learned is this. If you don't affect the dollar, you don't get change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't affect the dollar, you don't get change. And I don't know if this was a good or a bad thing. I actually met Dave Brandon. I actually like Dave Brandon. I don't know if people perceived that he was good at his job or not, but I'm just using him as an example. All I know is this. When the student body in one way, shape, or form felt like they didn't want him to be the AD anymore, he was not the AD anymore. Right? Um, if the, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad this actually question got asked. I, please take this from today. We're not upset. We're not bitter. Exactly. We're not exactly. salty. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm happy with my life, actually. I love my life. It's great. Right. Right. That's why I didn't participate in the EA, the Ed O'Bannon thing. Let, let me just, let me just, that's crazy that you brought that up. <clears throat> let me tell you why I didn't participate. Because EA support my school. And I'm like, Whatever nominal check you got, I bet EA gave our school a bigger one. Right. So I was like, I'm not participating. Right. I'm going to be selfish. Right. And so, <laughs> and, and, and with that, however, the students can keep it going because the, the, the university is all about the yes. student body. Agreed. That gets lost a lot. You know, it becomes about the coaches and the administrators and the brand and the hype. But in theory, it's about the students. So keeping the conversation going, being active about it, that then creates change, in my opinion. Thank you, Dave. Kevin, were you, were you writing down because you wanted to get in on that question? Or no? No, I'm just always writing stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't we go over here? Thank you, Dave. Hi, thanks for being here, Stephen Schmier, Detroit native and MBA boss grad here. Uh, Jalen mentioned awkward. I wanted just to continue that thought with uh, giving some comments about Chris Weber. And you know, even if we can raise a banner, I imagine that only before they're raising the banner. 
and, uh, you know, and just your general thoughts about that, and maybe also mention about uh, basketball schools, if you had any thoughts about, you know, if you, how you would be treated at a Duke, or Kentucky, or Kansas, et cetera. Oh, it is different at a basketball school. It's way different. You guys agree? Also, I, don't, I do not disagree with that. It, it's way different for whatever that's worth. But I mean, we still love Michigan. Um, but the real question you, I'm pretty sure people want to hear me say it, is about Chris Webber. So me and Chris have been friends since we were 12. This is way before Michigan. We played 13 and under AAU together. And so I have a lot of different thoughts about how things have transpired in our relationship over that period of time. And what I've grown to understand is that just because you were tight or friends with somebody in high school or in college, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be friends 20, 30 years later. You do grow up, you do grow apart. For me, I don't think he's ready to admit this or at least publicly, but I truly believe that there's some pain that he has because if you think about it, he was the person that traveled and they didn't call it. He was the person that called timeout. We lost as a team though. Like, I look back at that game, and people say, man, y'all lost because of timeout. I feel like I had one of the worst games I ever played that game. So when you're a part of the team, you're thinking about what you could have done better. And so that's how I looked at that game. I still do. Um, and I think through that pain of those two situations I talked about, lying to the grand jury. I think in his head, he wanted to just erase that this all ever happened. Like, I'm just washing my hands. Like when you break up with somebody, it's just like, I'm done, I'm done. And, and that's what I truly think that's taking place in his head and heart is him removing himself from us and removing himself from Michigan takes him away from something that really represents pain in his head and in his heart. Thank you. Do, you, do either of you want to, do we have something different to add to that? That's enough. Topic? Yeah. I mean, I know for it's, me, not, because I know there's a lot of people lining up. Yeah, yeah. right. So That's why, yeah. Okay, let's go on. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Robin Williams. So imagine 25 years ago walking on a college campus as big as University of Michigan and thinking, how am I going to fit in? Well, I have to say that the Fab Five was part of my experience. Um, a lot of my memories are based around lining up, going to the game. So not just the Fab Five, Michigan basketball team. A lot of my friendships were formed that way. Even when we talk today, we have comments about what happened around going to those games. We wanted to be first in the student section. I even snuck and put it on my Entree Plus because I didn't have the money for the, <laughs> for the team tickets. So. My parents didn't even know, so that was good. That was a good thing. So I have to say this, with the banners, I really, that's, those are my Fab Five. That was my Michigan basketball team. Yeah. So when they came down, I had to write a letter. I mean, it was just, I couldn't fathom how they could do that to me. So I, had to, I made it personal. But I wanna say that these experiences are for the student body. I mean, we had so much fun just just celebrating, and I was reserved and shy. I was trying to fit in. I, I wasn't a big talker, but I remember that, and I really appreciated that experience. Um, so in terms of the banner, I always think, especially between the ages of 18 to 21, I'm glad that my experiences and my failures weren't so public. Um, you're making decisions. You don't have the same information that I have now. So in my opinion, and I work in the schools, in my opinion, discipline is to be corrective, not dire. And in this situation, I don't think anyone learned anything from this. When I discipline students, it's supposed to correct the behavior, not continue forever. And so we have to think about that. But in terms of that, I wanna look up here at Ray, Jimmy, and Jalen, and I just wanna say this. You all work with students now. I work with students. 85% of my class uh, come from single parent homes. And a lot of times they don't think that they're competing um, at the same level. Some of, the, some of the motivation has been stifled. And I want to know if you could say one thing to these students. I know it's so much you can say, trust me. But if you could say one thing in going forward, 
What is your main message that you communicate to the students that you work with? And let me say, it's great to see you, uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, I don't know if the, because it, it's hard to see from this vantage, because it took me a while, I recognized the voice. I love you, I love you. We, yeah. we, we, yeah, she was a part of the, let me tell you how much a part of it she was. We would, you know, hang out at the union or, you know, be parties at the union or there was something going on on the weekend, everybody's trying to, you know, relax and, and do something and, and kick it. A lot of times, she was, she was very quiet, very reserved, very smart. Right? She, she knew better than to get involved with any of us. <laughs> That's number one. Because uh, I tried. <clears throat> but <laughs> so in, in those conversations, she used to be like, oh, nah, man. I'm straight on you. However, that was worth that. That was worth the five hour flight. I swear it was. It was, worth, it was worth. She was like, yeah, I'm straight on you, but however, you need to be blah, 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 and blah, blah. I'm like, you watching the game like that? She was like, yeah, you, you know, you didn't help rotate. And why come, how come Jalen and, and, and Ray all you know, night? Watching the film next day in practice, I was like, dang, she right. <laughs> so, so, so thank you, Robin. Thank you. And, and I love it that you were in education and we got to catch up. Please uh, come see, you know, us before before you cut out. Questions now? Question? No, no, I just wanted to get that over. Y'all can answer the question. Go ahead, and the question, That's what, what was the question, though? Because he got me out for A word for your students. <laughs> what, for the students. What you would say to your students. <laughs> My bad. Word of advice. A word of advice for the, the students that come from a single parent environment is my thing would be embrace the difficulties and make a change when you move forward and become a parent. You know, a lot of people don't embrace the process. You know, the process of going through hardship. And that's one of the things Jay touched on was my discomfort for coming back is because I felt like we were thrown away. But what it has done since I learned to embrace it has made me a better influence on people's lives that are coming after me. You understand? So my thing would be embrace the difficulties, learn from it, and make a change when you get to the point where you can. Because at some point you'll become a father or a mother. Don't leave your kids. Don't have unprotected sex with somebody you know you don't plan on being with. You understand? Those are the conversations that you really got to have with the kids. It's not one thing I would give them. It's a, it's a group of conversations that you have to have with these kids. I, I just can't talk to them one time. So I hate to answer your question that way, but it's, it's a relationship building process that you go through with those kids. I, uh, I want to add something here. Um, this process has been challenging in some ways for me because I am partly uh, representing the university as a spokesperson for the event and so forth, but I am also a faculty member and an educator myself. And so I'm speaking now, I want to make clear to everybody, just as Yago, faculty member, um, I think it's really remarkable that a remarkable part of this story that despite the perceptions around all of you all, really, um, especially in relation to college athletics and education, that you have all committed so much of your time, basically in some ways dedicated your lives to education. And I just really feel, I said that in my opening remarks that I thought you all were teachers. I just want to emphasize that because I think it's being made evident in ways that might not have been clear to everybody ahead of time. So Yago, let me <laughs> touch on this too. Let me touch on this. <laughs> And like Jalen stated, you can't get into U of M if you don't have some kind, of, some form of education, no matter how good you are as a basketball player. But from a basketball perspective, we played or we executed one of the most difficult systems there, there is possible, possible to play. I mean, we played at a high level knowledge-wise. We had a high IQ on the court. We made it look fun. But we were watching tape not too long ago, and we were like, man, we ran them systems, we look like a pro team. You understand? So our mindset, and our, it's a reason that we push education. We look back at old footage and we see Jimmy always reading. You understand? Always studying, even at 18, 19 years old. 
So when dealing with this group, you got to understand that <laughs> you got to understand that the IQ is up here, man. And it's not just a basketball IQ. I keep saying life. It's a life IQ, you know, so. Thank you. Let me get one. Meta, yeah, uh, Meta Wooden Peace asks, what was your favorite trash talk moment while you guys played there? So Can you repeat favorite that trash question? Talk, favorite trash Can talk moment. Yes. What was your favorite trash talk moment while you were playing <laughs> at Mish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, got, I got one that sticks out, man, and I don't know if he wants me to say this, but I, I mean, it just, it just started out my game the right way, man. I just, cause I was just coming back from an injury too, and it just kind of made me feel real good about the situation. Like I'm back with the group. We're about to play your Iowa team. And we walk out on the court, man, and Jay Rose told AC Earl he was built like his sister, man. And it was like, man, I mean, I just, it, I mean, it was so many, but that one because I was going through some, some mental things at the time, getting back acquainted to the court. I mean, man, from that point on, man, we just rolled, man. It just, I, I couldn't stop laughing at him, but we had a lot of them. <laughs> I think one, one particular time we were uh, warming up against Oklahoma State. Um, Byron Houston. In Lexington. In Lexington. Yeah, I was Byron, gonna bring that up. I was you was gonna, gonna bring, bring that, that up? up? Byron Houston. Because we overheard that. Oh, uh, you heard? You heard. <laughs> we overheard that. So, wow. so, so it was very public though. Yeah. So we were standing at half court and we were watching them warm up. We didn't do that often. Like, but particularly because Byron Houston was supposed to be this great phenom, right? We walk out on the court, we look at him, we like, dude, you ain't bigger than now, you 6'3". We about to go through you. So, so we're really standing at half court, not even warming up because we're laughing like, man, we about to do you. We, we, we at half court, so y'all know we at half court like, man, dog, what's happening, dog? Man, yo, you, oh my God. Hey man, time out, time out. Yo, this guy, yeah, we, was, we were um, fooling, having fun, but really um, the trash talk we did to, like Ray said, to pump each other up. And that's what, you know, I try to express to, you know, my players, your game is your ultimate mouthpiece. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't ever have to tell anybody how good you are. It's all about your play. And you know that from the work that you actually put in. So we were very confident because we busted each other's tails every, every single day. There was not one day. Like, the best part, I, I hate that y'all never saw it. Yeah. Practice was it. No, no doubt. Going at these guys every day. And because we loved each other and wanted to make each other go against Freddie every day. Freddie make you work. You you think you about to you you think you about to come off a screen and catch the ball? Oh yeah, no you're not. You better get the footwork together and make sure you use the screen properly because Freddie ain't gonna let you get the ball. So we 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 adopted that. We put in a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears to be successful. The end result was a way for us to let it out. That's why we were anxious for the games because with them four-hour practices were a monster. It's funny they talk about that Oklahoma State game because I remember that. <laughs> and Houston took it out on me, man. He set a screen so hard on me. If we wasn't on national TV, <laughs> I'd have cried. <laughs> 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 he just so happy. It happened to be his one time where he could catch me slipping, man. And he did. He set a screen, man. I was like, man, the camera's on me. Don't cry right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> just stay focused. But what he said about Freddie Hunter, and I, and I love giving credit to the guys that are part of this. Freddie Hunter is one of the only guys in my basketball career to dunk on me. Yeah. <laughs> but what, but why, why I remember that is because the, of the accountability that he brought to the table. It was one of them days, being a freshman, you know, I'm pouting, kind of homesick. I get out there and I'm going through the motions. Freddie came through, I slide over late, help late, and next thing I know, Freddie's over my head like, ah. <laughs> but when I get to the other end of the court, 
my teammates are telling me, man, you got to suck it up, man. You got to bring it every day. It's no time for slippage. So the accountability and the work ethic was important, man. I love you for that because, you know, you made me bring it every day. A lot of people talk about my work ethic, but they don't know where it started and how the work was generated from a guy like yourself. You know? Can I, can I give... Can I give the last part of the Byron Houston story? I'm sorry? The last part of the Byron yeah, Houston ahead. story? Yeah, so Byron Houston was an All-American. He was leading Oklahoma State. This is Lexington, 1992. This is their, this is your first run in the NCAA playoffs. This was your Just first big test. The, this was the team they had to get by. Sweet 16. Because Ohio State was waiting. Mm -hmm. So absolutely what Jimmy King said, we're going, we're watching going, <laughs> what, what this guy is, what is he doing? <laughs> Byron Houston has a lousy game. He wasn't big enough for Juwan or Chris. He wasn't quick enough or long enough for you guys on the wing. Towards the end of the game, he gets fouled and he goes to the free throw line. And one of you three walked by Byron Houston, and as you're going by him, you slowed down, you said, hmm, guess we cost you a lot of money going into the NBA, huh? And kept going. <laughs> that, exactly. Am I right? I uh, feel bad. I, <laughs> I felt bad for him. <laughs> I felt bad. That's wrong. That's good. That's so mean. Oh, uh, my goodness. You didn't mean it. You didn't mean it. But see, nobody talks about what was said to us, though. You understand? That's true. Nobody That's ever true. says what That's was said to us. That's because you're elders. You're not supposed to yeah. talk about that. Right. Respect the elders. Let me, let me get a couple more questions before we wrap Hi, up. Hi, my name is Rick Hammond. I've been going to basketball games since Ricky Green threw up Hubbard. Gave me the greatest memories ever of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't feel any sense of betrayal. I, you've done your time. Put the banners back up. Acknowledge what we all saw with our eyes. And my question is um, I had a friend who traveled with you as part of the athletic department. And he claimed, I want you to confirm it, that the only time you were all speechless is when you were in Atlanta and Muhammad Ali did a magic trick for you. Is that consistent? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that. Thank you. Man, I mean, with him passing, man, it, it kind of brought back a lot of those memories. It was, it was iconic. And I think that was part of the fuel in our run that year was running into Muhammad Ali. And the way he embraced us, I think that's what allows us to be public figures that you can put hands on, that you don't have to see every blue moon like the Loch Ness Monster or what have you. But I mean, just his personality and how he talked to us and the conversation we had, it was incredible, man. It, it changed my life. You know, for somebody that I always looked up to, my father looked up to, it was major. And just the knowledge that he gave us at that time, it was only like an hour or so that he spent with us, but it changed my life. It was, it was tremendous. I still have pictures at my house of Muhammad Ali and us sitting around like little kids with our mouth open, <laughs> just watching him talk. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Jason Toe. I'm a current senior here. Uh, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so just kind of going on like, the last question, but I think say impermissible benefits is a, I mean, it's a really big uh, topic because, for example, like I was just talking to my mom and she was telling, I was telling her about talking to Fat Five and things like this and she was saying, so you're telling me, like, if I went to our church and people just wanted to, like, give me money to get to you, they couldn't do that? And I said, no, they couldn't do that. That's illegal. Um, and going through, we've seen things, I mean, we've seen teams get championships stripped um, for things like getting, like, a, uh, like a tuxedo. So I know, in, like, with Georgia Tech in 2009, their ACC, uh, championship football titles trip for $300 that Demarius Thomas got for a suit. Or I know that um, when Jameis Winston went to a Publix and one of the workers just gave him some crab legs, um, he, you know, he walked out, um, but basically said he stole it because it was better to say he stole it than to say, hey, someone actually gave this for me free, ended up losing his scholarship. So my hope, my, like my end question is, do you see uh, at all the NCA maybe looking at cases more 
kind of like what's going on and looking at like you know, the full monetary value and also to not have these full like life or death things where it's like we're gonna take the championship away or take these scholarships away to these kids that actually need you know need the um, need the opportunity to go to school you know so they can learn and grow um, in the future. So. Maybe yeah, like I, I agree. They, they do need to um, alter their um, ruling. And, and just like um, um, Kevin was saying earlier, when you think about um, they want athletes to be compensated, but they just don't want to compensate them, right? And there are ways of doing that. And I think if they were to, and, and universities as well, I think if they want to um, sort of set the record straight, they have to alter a lot of their rules and allowing athletes to benefit from the talent. Similar to the question that came in earlier, uh, when we talk about other models that are available, there are other students that are on campus, on scholarships that are able to generate revenue. Why shouldn't student athletes have that same type of opportunity? All right, and they have to change rules in order to do that, change policy. In order to do that. The, the, this is one of those topics that has evolved over time as the public and the media got more sophisticated. When we were in college and we were acknowledging the fact that student athletes were being exploited fiscally, at that time it was, shut up, you should be happy you're going to school and you got a scholarship. I would take a free scholarship, but you can't play basketball. They recruited me to come to Michigan. When you are really talented, and this is what I talk to young people about, you wanna get recruited like LeBron James? get a really high SAT or ACT score. Mm -hmm. And so that type of currency takes place with those that are special in our society. And it doesn't have an age limit. You see childhood actors and actresses right, right. in all type of endeavors. But in collegiate sports, in particular basketball and football, it's easier for them not to pay or consider paying the players because they could keep all of the money. That, that's really what it is. You don't have to share anything. And there's gonna be the old adage of, you know, how do the smaller schools compete with the big five schools and yeah. things of that's, that that's, that's, that's smoke. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Correct. Correct, that's window shopping. Like, no. Here's the thing. How much was Michigan's deal with um, Brand Jordan? 174. 174. Okay. How many athletes here, 900? I would say you could give each of those athletes, I'll, I'll put a number to it. What about maybe, hmm. what, hmm. $5,000 a semester? Like $10,000 a year times 900? I'm not mm -hmm. that smart, but what's that, 9 million? <laughs> it's not my field. What's that, 9 million? Yes, you, you did that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's, you're giving $10,000 to 900 students. Is that $9 million? How many students? Mathematicians. 10,000, 10,000. 900 students. Yes. Yes. Nine million. Nine million. That's nine yeah. million dollars, right? Yes. OK. Yes. yes. So that's add, the, <laughs> add the zeros. Add the zeros. <laughs> Where's my phone? Get my phone. Oh, yeah. Add the zeros. See, you got to add but, it but up. What ends up happening? Nine, is zero, <laughs> zero, <laughs> ten. Zero, oh, zero, 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 zero. He has his class here. Oh, hey, you got it. Right. 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 <laughs> so all y'all taking this time to see if my nine million is right, really? All right. So, but a lot of times people talk about problems, but they don't talk about solutions. So I'll give a solution. There are 900 kids that are here as student athletes that are competing that if you chose to give each of those kids $10,000 total, that's only $9 million. Right. How much was the deal? 174. Oh, 174 with 15 okay. years. Now, now, let me put, of those 900, less than, I would say 200 probably need it. Or I would say half, over half would need it because of their parental income. You know, that's the whole system. When you right. think about, I go, I go back to the figures I gave earlier. Right. When you talk about the, uh, you know, 90% of the revenue that is generated under 1%, is African American men, and I'm you know if you look at need based funding or need based resourcing, however you want to look at it, you know very few student athletes, right, that or the student athletes that are generating the most revenue, um, probably need the resources more 
then the entire athletic department, we talk about the sort of the athletes that are on non-revenue or sports or on um, partial scholarships. I, I hate to, I really hate to do this, but we're gonna have to wrap up. So I wanted to do that by just asking you all um, in a word or sentence, how you would describe the most important legacy of the Fab Five. So I'm gonna start with you, mm -hmm. Billy. I, I would say cultural um, um, resilience is how I would describe it. If I were to write about it, which I probably will, one of the things I would write about is these brothers' cultural resilience in the sense that they were able to maintain a cultural and racial identity within a system that often morphs racial groups or ethnic groups into something totally different. When you talk about academic um, institutions or athletic departments, I've seen a lot of brothers that emerge out of these institutions, brothers and sisters that look some totally different than who they parents raised. How about you, Kevin? Um, maybe confrontation. <clears throat> not in a, not necessarily in a overtly strident way, but just um, they in their own way confronted this very unethical and moral system. Ray? Uh, mine would be, the word would be incomplete because it's not done yet. The legacy hadn't been established yet because as you see, the great things that my brothers are doing, once we unify and come together, I think the legacy will be cemented then. So it's unfinished. It's still great things that we plan on accomplishing as the Fab Five. I'm gonna go to Jalen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say the best for last. Uh, you get the last word. For me, it's a, uh, we were smart enough to understand it, and I mentioned this earlier, there's the score of the game and it's a game of life. And uh, as I look at the picture of, of our team, you know, these are all individuals that are trying to still do prominent things with their lives. What ended up happening with, with athletes, especially college athletes, it's almost like when you're done with school, it's like, where are they now? Um, we were really fortunate that Chris is a television personality. Jawan works for the Miami Heat. They both are coaches. I'm fortunate enough to work with ESPN. Rob Palinka is one of the top agents in the industry. Um, played on our team. Freddie also works with young people. So for me, that legacy and how I would define it is just don't define it by what happened on the court. Good, good. Because that's where it gets lost. It, it was, it's not just about the score of the game. Right on. Jeff? And, and since I'm getting the last word, thank, thank you, you all for coming and, and joining this conversation uh, this evening. Uh, it means a lot to us. This is a long time coming. Yeah. So we appreciate all of you. Um, to my eCourse family, um, I really, I really uh, was looking forward to getting a question from a couple of my players. So if we had time, if we, if we could get one of the players to ask a question. Dorian. <laughs> and then Dorian. I wanted to ask a question to the audience Dorian. as well. Dorian, stand up, stand up, please. He's right there, please. He hand him a mic. This young man right here, and um, you know, as I was looking out there and I saw him standing in line, this is who he is. This is what it's about to bring opportunities to young individuals like this. And he's a young man that has a, a mature personality. Also. And I told him this yesterday. He has the potential to be one of the best guards in the state. He's so fast, can't nobody check him. John Beeline, look out. This kid right here could do it. So go ahead, Dorian. Come on, fellas, we gotta go. Yeah, it looks like a team question. Come on, Doug. What made you come to U of M? What made me, us, come to U of M? Good question. Well, a lot of what we've discussed today 
the marriage between academics and athletics at this university was paramount. All of us, when we came together, we talked about that. And again, it, it's, you know, it, it lends to what we were, and my word is, I'm gonna tie this together, my word is conscious. We were conscious of who we were and what we wanted. And that doesn't mean that it's always gonna be or go in a direction that you foresee it, but as long as you can have your eyes on the goal, your path can go any kind of way, and that's okay, because that is what we're talking about. There are things that happen in our lives that we never thought of. But like Ray said earlier, we gotta learn from those things and then evolve to give back, to change, so that it's a easier, or not maybe not necessarily easier, but a, um, a road that you guys have to travel that there are less surprises around the corner that will make it a little bit easier for you in a transition to the next level. But let's not get it twisted, man. University of Michigan is the best university in the country, bro. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It, it's not a secret. I mean, for me, like I said, I came to the school I love. So this is a great university. And this discussion, and that's what I hate about the sanctions. We're a family, so this is a family discussion. This is not something for everybody, and we're not talking about our, or downing our family. Yes. We're just trying to rebuild our family and make it stronger. At the end of the day, this is the best university in the world. We have to be a part of it. And, and I want to kind of want the last word. No, not at all. No, I just no, want to no, piggyback no. on what he said is uh, being an alum, being an alum of Michigan is terrific. Yes. There's not a place that I go, airport, mall, gas station, that somebody's not coming up to me saying go blue, right. that it's not an acknowledgement. And also, some people that can help you job with jobs and career prospects and, and contacts as well. So as, as much as we're talking about sports, to be a student that went to the University of Michigan has really done a lot for me and done a lot for all of us. All of us. Perfect. Thank you. So we really are out of time. I'm sorry to say, and I'm sorry to say there will not be time uh, for these guys to provide autographs. Um, thank you all for coming today and being part of this conversation, and especially thank all five of you for being here. And, and, and lastly, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't take a tragedy for it to happen. I agree. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't take a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys.